Welcome to Breaking Banks. Conventional wisdom in the United States that this you know, what can be referred to as a patchwork approach to regulation with the number of regulatory bodies overlapping jurisdiction, a lot of confusion, is that that is bad for innovation. But Donna, in some of the conversations you and I've had in the recent article that you've published, it also creates an opportunity. And maybe we can start off, Donna, why don't we talk a little bit about the alphabet soup? How do we get here in the first place? There certainly is an alphabet soup of regulation. I can start with the SEC, the CFTC, IRS, OCC, FDIC, and the list goes on and on. And these are just the federal agencies I named. We have about 50 state regulators as well. So there certainly is an alphabet soup of regulation. But I would argue that although it provides a challenge for startups to navigate uh, this complex morass of regulators, uh, just like a distributed ledger, this the, this number of different nodes or different regulators provide strengths in terms of getting a consensus. I think that having this alphabet soup of regulation means that we strike the right balance between safety, soundness, and innovation in our financial system. So while the gives us kind of the right level of safety and soundness with all of those overlaps, how can anyone get anything done from an innovation point of view? I think... It's definitely a challenge, and I don't want to dismiss that challenge out of the box. What we need is more collaboration and communication to deal with the overlapping regulation and to try to prevent contradictory interpretations. Sandra, from your perspective, it is, is it a strength or is it a weakness? Oh, that's a million-dollar question. It's both. I, I think we should, one, appreciate the US regulatory system for what it is. It has created the most resilient, robust, and deepest and biggest capital markets in the world, first of all. But secondly, it has its challenges when it comes to digital assets and crypto. And frankly, the US, I'm not gonna mince words here, needs to get its freaking act together. That was a slight mince, by the way. You could have done a lot, but this is a fam this is a family friendly show. And so let's be specific. Where does it need to get its act together? Yeah. So I appreciate that states are and a few states are really leading uh, Wyoming, even New York State DFS has really started um, becoming more innovative and communicative. And I think those are good things. But where we need the help is at the federal level. And we need a more synthesized, um, number one, communication path between the different entities uh, that regulate different parts of our global capital markets. But also we need, you know, frankly, some leadership and guidance from the executive branch as well as Congress. Uh, we've not seen a clear focus and understanding that this is number one, an incredibly important topic. And number two, the increased communication that needs to happen from the legislators as well as the regulators. CFTC Chairman Tarbert just mentioned that he believed there should be federal regulation of crypto assets. And I understand that appeal. But I worry that when we look at jurisdictions like the UK and the FCA, where we have one monolithic regulator, that if they get things wrong, it's actually more harmful than good. Yeah, I have to say, to be frank, I'm not so sure that I agree that we need to have a whole separate entity that is created to govern crypto assets separately from all the other asset classes out there. Uh, frankly, I think each of the individual regulators uh, in their corner, whether it's securities or whether it's derivatives and commodities, need to be very clear about the oversight and enforcement of their corner. So, Donna, let's lean into this and give us the counter argument. So if the monolithic getting it wrong is a negative, which I think we can all agree, you know, wrong is typically bad. How is there an opportunity in this distributed environment around distributed regulatory bodies? Well, I believe that each of these different regulators, as Sandra alludes to, has a specific purpose and focus of their regulation. So if you look at the CFPB, it's to prevent fraud in the consumer sector. You look at the SEC, it's for transparency and disclosure and the sale of securities and the raising of capital. At the CFTC, it's to prevent market manipulation and provide for the hedging of risk. So they all have a slightly different focus. And therefore, I think that the regulators are going to come at it with a different perspective. And this patchwork can actually become a quilt that is both strong and flexible. So where we are today, um, unfortunately, are a couple regulatory bodies that are 
um, coming out and, and attempting to draw lines and make clear um, their intended role. But what we don't have is the intercommunication we probably need from all the regulatory bodies to agree, you will do this and you will do that. Um, ABC will do Y and, and XYZ will do, you know, another another thing. What we're seeing is um, overlap and confusion, which of course then translates into frictions, additional costs and uncertainty for our crypto and uh, fintech entrepreneurs. And that's never we are separately seeing some competing regulatory agendas, and I don't think it will be any different in the crypto and distributed ledger space. Yeah. Well, and it's that competition and uncertainty that I think really poses the challenge because investors like more than anything is a level of certainty. So if we look on a global scale, and Donna, why don't we start with you? Who do you think is getting it right in terms of building out these markets that has that right balance of innovation, a level of certainty, but not overly stifling? Well, the first jurisdiction that comes to mind is the UK. If you look at the development of fintechs generally, I think they've been at the forefront. I think they've managed to strike the right balance between regulation and fostering innovation. I would add to that, frankly, Singapore and Switzerland, um, I think are generally known as being number one out there very quickly with guidance and articulating uh, what they believe are right frameworks for uh, Singapore and the Asia region, and then in Switzerland for um, you know actually global access. And what's happened? Well, in Switzerland, they've got something called Crypto Valley and Zook. Um, in Singapore, you see tons of companies setting up shop. And since Hong Kong's had its own issues recently, uh, you, you begin to start seeing coalescing of, of crypto and digital asset firms setting up shop in Singapore. Well, and so you bring up an interesting point, right? So we're even seeing a global patchwork of the different approaches and some doing it exceedingly well. But Sandra, back to one of your lead in points, the US is still the largest in the market. So how do we begin to tie in if any of these innovations that are happening outside of the US eventually will need to come into the US? Is that a correct kind of assumption and approach? Oh, I think there is a huge amount of interest um, going both ways. So there are Asia-based companies in the crypto and digital asset space that would like to set up shop in the US. I've had numerous conversations with companies that want to set up a hub in either New York or Silicon Valley and, and, and have a have an office here and an entity here, for example. But um, they find it often uh, too difficult, too costly. Uh, so they're waiting on the sidelines. And then conversely, you've seen American entrepreneurs who've jumped ship and gone and set up shop in Singapore or Switzerland or the UK because it's just easier. Donna, next question for you, for those that you work with, because this is a huge part of your practice, how do you help begin to find an on-ramp into the US for the innovations that have taken place elsewhere? Well, we start off by talking about what's their business case? Can we read their white paper? What are they trying to achieve and who are they trying to achieve it with? And to Sandra's point, they're often coming to us, having started out in other jurisdictions, but they realize that the US presents two unique opportunities that they can't pass up. One is the access to capital, and the second one is access to a relatively wealthy consumer or client base. So for those two reasons, they come back and talk to us and we evaluate their business case, and we think whether or not they can enter the US slowly through a state-by-state -state business, like say money servicing, or what they're talking about really may potentially be a security offering where they're gonna be stuck in SEC land no matter what. And it's a lot of education. I would say the first three calls that I have with most of my digital asset clients is sort of saying, yes, I know you only want to do this. Or yes, I know perhaps you don't even want to transact with US people. But given the long arm reach of the US regulators, you're going to have to confront sooner rather than later the US regulatory scheme, especially if you want to be investable by institutional investors. And that's what usually gets them over the hump. Yeah. And, and I think it's a great thing that, you know, Donna and her firm have a practice that really helps um, fintech and crypto entrepreneurs um, do that and make that transition. Um, I think what government can do is just help to make it a bit easier uh, so that the red tape and the frictions and the costs, you know, are, are something that an outside firm can afford to set up shop in the U.S. Donna, I'm, I'm curious if you have any horror stories or shock stories you can share 
of you know someone who's been successful outside of the U.S. gets here, and their first thing is like the the, the what? What are you kidding me? I have to do what? <laughs> Well, that's typically the first reaction. You can talk about what's the difference between a utility token and a security token. Well, I just want to issue this token that's going to be used on my platform to accomplish my business purpose, maybe for governance reasons. But yes, I will be raising money and I will be using that money to build out my platform, my system. It's going to be very difficult to conclude in those circumstances that you're not subject to the U.S. securities laws if you're making that offer to U.S. people, even if you give your tokens away. Even if you give them away. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like the argument around, am I really a lender if I don't charge interest? Sandra, I'm curious, what horror stories have you either heard or seen? Well, I mean, I think um, the ones that have been the most prominent that come to mind are the ones of uh, a few of the Asia-based firms, particularly um, out of China, trying to you know set up shop in um, the U.S., you know, I think they understand how to navigate perhaps uh, what the Chinese government may or may not do. But I think when it comes to the U.S., because you have to talk to so many different groups at the state level, at the federal level, you really do need help. And I think that's the number one thing they me- realize immediately, which is, oh, my gosh, OK, I need an entire team on the ground here dealing with this. It's not just one person setting up shop. Well, and this is why I think entrepreneurs become enamored with the concept of DeFi. Right. Like if it is a patchwork of compliance and regulation, what if we actually just took all of that away and said, you know, this becomes self-governing? Donna, why don't you introduce the concept for those who haven't followed it, although I suspect there are a large number uh, of listeners who are deep in on the DeFi. Sure. So DeFi refers to a form of finance that does not rely on central intermediaries such as exchanges or brokerages or banks, and instead uses distributed ledger technology to accomplish financial transactions. And it usually marries smart contracts, this idea that you can have an if-then statement embedded in the blockchain. Let's take a securities option as a simple example. If a certain date comes, i.e. the exercise date, If the price of that security is above the strike price, the option will be deemed exercised and cash will flow versus settlement of the security. And it's all hard-coded and automated in the blockchain. It doesn't require the exchange or your broker to take any action. DeFi certainly holds a lot of promise, but there are also a lot of issues that need to be addressed for it to fulfill its promise. And as much as I... Uh, love, you know, the the experimentation and the innovation that's going on in the DeFi space. Um, you know, we've seen a number of uh, hacks and or um, smart contracts that have gone wrong. And the question I always have is, what's the recourse? Uh, for all those investors out there, there's no recourse right now. Not that I know of. Well, and this goes back to the looking for certainty. Who do you hold accountable? Or as um, one friend had put it, you need a throat to choke when it all goes wrong. People often ask me if I'm worried, what happens when DeFi takes off and smart contracts rule the world? Will we need lawyers anymore? And I just chuckle because absolutely, we're not going away anytime soon. What might shift is the presumption of who needs to chase who for the money, right? Who has the money and who needs to sue to get it back? But DeFi doesn't really change the fact that there will continue to be disputes. There will continue to be errors and there will continue to be fraud. It's all part of human nature. We may just be in different postures as we're dealing with these issues. Well, that this part has always intrigued me from the DeFi concept. Like, If it blows up, and there have been other networks that have gone broke and other doesn't it just all kind of disappear? Like what jurisdiction would you even begin to to sue in if the whole thing has been decentralized? Well, that's an excellent question. And we spend a lot of time thinking about what governing law applies. There are concepts, for example, in a permission blockchain where you have a group of people coming together and agreeing to work together on a system and be participants, they can agree to a governing law. Or in a contract, we negotiate and often agree as to which governing law is going to apply. For example, the laws of Switzerland, the laws of New York State, However, in a permissionless, truly distributed blockchain, it becomes an issue of where people are located. And as we know, nodes can be global. Where is the property located? What kind of touch points are there with various jurisdictions? And it becomes very complicated, a complex set of questions that leads to uncertainty, which is where we started the show off, which is uncertainty is less than ideal to promote a safe, sound, and resilient financial system. 
Well, and so this brings us back to if the permission is one of the central themes that could make it work and get some of the benefits, that brings us back to the idea of the number of countries talking about the idea of a sovereign digital asset. Sandra, go. Good, bad. Are we talking CBDCs now? Central CBDCs. Bank? Yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, for those who are interested, BIS has come out with a number of really good work, uh, uh, white papers on the topic. Um, so is the World Economic Forum and a number of other institutions. Um, not every single CBDC is the same. Actually, they're different. And my understanding from a Credit Suisse banker I was speaking to the other day, uh, he's tallied 80 plus CBDC projects around the world, whether you believe that or not, um, I guess the point being is there's a hype cycle around CBDC. Well, not just a hype cycle. It's not like they're entirely new. So Donna, what's different this time? I'm not sure I can really answer that because part of the question is, what are they trying to accomplish? We've seen this, for example, in the security settlement system. There's technology available today, whether on the blockchain or not, that would provide for and allow for instantaneous settlement but we don't do it. And that's because we have embedded, ingrained interests that don't want that to change. So when you look at a central bank digital currency, what is the government trying to accomplish? Are they trying to grant more transparency? Are they trying to scale? Are they trying to grant more access to underserved individuals in their country? And depending on what their purpose is, there may be benefits to CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, but there may not be any particular advantage. Sandra, yeah. where do you see the advantages versus disadvantages? Is there a place for a CBDC? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, uh, the CBDC profiles I like are particularly in developing countries that have really poor banking infrastructure. So the central bank is going to step in to deliver um, digital wallets and access directly to those individuals because the banking sector just is not developed. And actually, some have argued that they are going to help the banking sector by bringing along um, all the population who are currently, quote unquote, unbanked by adopting CBDC and then using the bank having a mobile wallet be that intermediary who will um, facilitate the actual CBDC transactions. Well, in, so this also poses an interesting dilemma, a lot like the payments rails, where the countries that were further behind were able to leapfrog because, you know, if you look at the um, better developed states, you end up in this, oh, what we have is good enough. Hello, ACH in the United States. I can get toilet paper delivered to my door by Amazon faster than I can get a transaction to settle between two accounts that I happen to own because they're going to two different institutions. Are we going to end up in the same position when it comes to using digital assets and creating CBDCs that those that were behind suddenly find themselves ahead because they don't have um, the logistical issues of infrastructure that's good enough? Sandra, why don't you go first? Look, I think in the US, um, there's a use case that a couple of folks in the blockchain space and I talk about that we really like for the US. So uh, many of you may or may not be familiar with the SNAP program, which is effectively food stamps. That is a very specific tool that the US government uses to basically feed uh, people. Imagine that program as part of a CBDC strategy, which then would include other specific, narrow, um, targeted distribution of funding through a CBDC mechanism. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but it's an interesting concept and in how can the US use refined monetary, monetary tools it doesn't have today to actually help the end user, AKA certain citizens in the well, United States. That's one of the most interesting use cases I've heard yet. Donna, I'm curious, what other use cases are you most excited about, whether in the U.S. or outside of the U.S. related uh, to a sovereign digital asset? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily an exciting or innovative use case, but if you had a really robust central digital currency, the control that a central bank could have over monetary policy and currency flows in a much more detailed way would be greatly improved. So I think that you would have improvement in the ability of a central bank to tightly control monetary policy if you had a country that had a truly digital only currency, which I think is very far off. Right now, we're looking at digital currencies to augment current systems. And again, those use cases are mostly centered around the unbanked or underserved by our current financial system. 
Yeah, that augmentation to me really is the first really attractive case that I have heard on the show. We're looking at that narrow application where you can actually really zero in, as you did, Sandra, on what is the problem that we're trying to solve and how does this fit, which actually ties back, Donna, to where you started, which is what is the problem you're trying to solve when it comes to um, you know, the application? In, if, if we think on a global scale of some of the challenges that are going to need to be solved for some of this to take place, you know, Donna, if you could be, you know, the emperor for a day of all, you know, global regulation related to, you know, to things, crypto and digital asset, what would be the first building blocks you'd put in place? Well, I think some of the first building blocks I would put in place would relate to transparency. By transparency, the thing that we're struggling with from a regulatory perspective with all of this digital asset, crypto, DeFi, is who is using these systems for what purpose? And are these purposes that are legitimate and lawful and should be encouraged? And that's the primary regulatory concern. So how do we get comfortable through our regulations that the rules relating to AML, KYC are being followed? They're all there for extremely good reasons, to prevent human trafficking, to prevent illicit drug sales. Yes, they do slow things down, but they're there for good reasons. And so I think that a real underpinning of regulation related to digital assets is transparency, which is in some ways at odds with its birth, right? And so now we're going to have to come to terms with that tension. And and speaking of that tension, Jason, if I could add to um, what Donna just said, um, I think that's really real. Look, I am all for digital programmable money. It's happening. You know, people just need to um, figure out what spots they're going to actually operate and scale. But uh, what concerns me is if governments have a truly functioning um, CBDC, they will have insight into every transaction we do. And here's the thing. No one should know, as far as I'm concerned, from a government standpoint, whether I spend my money on, you know, a bag of crisps or chips, or if I actually go to the gym. Um, it, it shouldn't be a nanny state. And that's where we could end up if it's not used properly and guardrails are not put in place to protect against illicit activity, but also giving the freedoms that people should, have, should rightfully have. Well, and there is the ultimate irony that from birth, this was meant to be the distributed outside of you know, sovereign purview. We could ultimately end up full circle where it creates the ultimate level of access into one's uh, finances in the flow of money. Yeah. Donna, as we close this out, how do you think about you know that irony about where decentralization actually could lead to the ultimate in your know, transparency to the individual level? Well, I think we're facing these issues right now, whether it's the central government or a large tech company or your bank. The data privacy concerns are paramount and we're struggling. Europe, again, is ahead of the US in how they deal with data privacy and protect that information from misuse, but it's still not perfect. The U.S. is still grappling with these issues. And so whether we're talking central bank digital currencies or DeFi generally, we need to deal with this issue now. Who has access to this information and why? And that's actually another great use case for the blockchain. It can allow individuals to exercise rights and have to give them the ability to control who has access to and use of their personal data. Hi, welcome to Breaking Banks Women in Fintech. Chloe James here. So excited to be bringing you another episode of our favorite Women in Fintech show. I've got a really exciting one today that I'm really uh, happy about uh, recording, talking all about partnerships, partnerships between big brands, huge uh, corporate organizations and and fintechs and, and how those relationships come about. I have two guests I'm delighted to introduce. Firstly, Jill Doherty, who's the head of business development and also looks after all fintech partnerships for Visa over the UK and also Ireland. Uh, Jill has uh, had numerous roles over a 20-year career, um, very senior roles at MasterCard um, also as well, and then also for global marketing agencies, a big marketing spin there, Grey Worldwide, McCann. She's worked with clients like Visa, who she's now with, Procter & Gamble, General Motors, Nestle, L'Oreal, just a huge uh, array. She's a global citizen. She was born in England and raised in South Africa. So you can uh, probably do what I did and and ask about the accent. But uh, Jill, welcome to Women in Fintech. Thank you so much, Chloe. It's great to be here. 
It's so nice to be speaking to you again. And uh, joining you today is Louise Hill, who is someone that you're partnering with. Louise is co-founder and COO of Go Henry, which is a prepaid pocket money card and app that empowers young people to take part in the digital economy. I absolutely love this story. She founded Go Henry in 2012 when she realized that her children were needing to learn how to manage money, don't we all? Um, and probably even more important than ever before, Louise, like Jill, over 20 years experience in commerce and operations. Um, she's been at the forefront in the retail industry and particularly the transition through to digital, which is uh, really interesting in that digital and e-commerce space. A uh, huge household names like Next Directory, John Lewis, the Innovations Group and Debnams, uh, some, some massive uh, names there. So Louise, welcome to Women in Fintech. Thank you. I'm uh, pleased to be here this evening. Well, it's it's great to be speaking to you. I just named my first child Louise last year. So <laughs> <laughs> I love the name. I love the name. Oh, and the, the, the listeners of the show know all about my little Louise. But anyway, let's just dive in. We've got, we've got um, you know, just under half an hour and I'm really looking forward to having this conversation about fintech partnerships with a major name like Visa. So Jill, I'm just going to start off with a little bit about your overall role because I think that's really good for context. But especially Especially when sure. it comes to those fintech partnerships and when it comes to selection and those working relationships, how that all comes about in your role. Absolutely. So a little bit about my role, first and foremost. So I lead a group of individuals that support fintechs and it's, it's all types of fintechs. It's very small, nascent fintechs at startup stage. So Go henry has been with us since 2012, since their inception in the UK and Ireland. Um, and then it's more mature fintechs um, as they progress and as they grow. Um, and then it's some of the big kind of bigger names now that have expanded beyond the UK and even Europe. Um, so the likes of, of Revolut um, and, and TransferWise. So it really is a, a broad spectrum. And, and what do we do for those fintechs? It's really about partnership, but it's about enablement. Um, and it's not, it's not as as narrow as just thinking about access to our network, which is FisaNet, it's much wider and deeper. And I guess I'll touch on that in a minute. But ultimately, what do we do? We look to understand the priorities of the fintech and help meet those priorities through, you know, growth and optimization of their existing products, their existing capabilities, and enable some of those use cases and experiences. Yeah, so it must be just you must come across some of the most interesting businesses. It's it's wonderful you just mentioned TransferWise. Then I just interviewed the founder uh, and CEO Christo Carmen this morning. Yes, at the Singapore FinTech Festival. So that was Fantastic. that was this morning's role. Now I'm speaking to you now. So yeah, those huge, huge, big uh, sort of uh, companies, and then all the way through, it must be absolutely fascinating. We're, we're going to come into more to the point of how your team actually really sort of engages. Louise, just a little bit more about Go Henry. I've kind of given it that real like gloss over, but I just wanted to get from you the light bulb moment, really exactly what the product is so people have a really good understanding and then also your journey to date uh, and where we find ourselves now in 2020, which has been a somewhat interesting year. <laughs> it certainly has. Um, <laughs> yes, Go, Go Henry really came about um, when my kids were, gosh, nine and eleven, I think, and um, they'd been lucky enough to both have been given iPods for Christmas. And like every kid I knew um, from parents uh, in our uh, our group, they were merrily downloading music using my iTunes account without a care in the world and certainly without any concept that that was money that they were spending. And, <laughs> yeah. um, I, the I, I think it's called the bank of mum and dad, isn't it? It, it certainly is. And that, that was definitely what was happening. And um, I started to print out the invoices that iTunes used to send you in those days every time, uh, every time there was a download and pin them on the fridge. And then on a Saturday morning when my kids stood in front of me with their hands outstretched for their pocket money, I would have these terrible conversations with them of, of maybe, you know, normally I would give you five pounds, but you've spent four pound 20 on iTunes. So guess what? You only get 80 pence. And uh, there would be a little sad face in front of me and <laughs> mum's the bad guy again. But I started talking to other parents about it. And actually it was, it was one day stood at the side of a school football pitch, watching my son and a number of other kids play football. 
And um, I told that exact same story and realized that every single other parent there responded with their own story. It was either their child had bought something deeply unsuitable on eBay or they'd uh, run up a bill on Xbox or, or whatever the case was. And I realized that we were leaving our kids behind. We'd all moved to online shopping. We were all using cards and, and contactless was just starting to emerge in the UK. And yet we were giving our kids cash and they had no way to understand digital money and how we were using money in the modern world. And that, that was, I guess, the light bulb moment. And um, to cut a long story short, uh, myself and, and two other parents from the school who were good friends, started to meet once a week at the local curry house um, in Limington <laughs> and see whether we could flesh this out into a business plan that made any kind of sense. And, um, you know, that that took quite a lot of work. You mentioned my background is e-commerce and, and retail. So while I dealt with card acquiring um, from a payments perspective, I didn't know anything about prepaid cards or or deeper levels of payment information. And we got put in touch with a contact at Visa mm -hmm. and went to meet with them and have a conversation. And I have to say, asked them millions of questions and just found the team there really supportive. Jill, Jill said it's, it's much wider than simply enabling access to their network. It, it certainly was. You know, the, the team there saw immediately what we wanted to do and started to help us shape what services from Visa would be relevant and how they could be looped together to, to deliver what we wanted to achieve, but also what other things we needed to bring um, into play and, and really to help us bring our plans to fruition. And, and now 1.2 million customers, I believe, across the US and UK uh, yeah. sort of working with this money management tool. I love this. I love that you've highlighted that Removal of, uh, you know, removal of the actual payment, you know, when things have become digital. And I, I first noticed this when I really started using Uber a lot and I just was Ubering everywhere and then my sort of bill would come at the end of the month and I'd go, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I've spent that much on Uber because you're not actually doing the transaction, right? And so this is um, such an important lesson for for, for kids and and really for the for the future of our economy I think um, something that I, I want to touch on just in in linking to that was I guess the importance around and Jill maybe this is one for you but the importance around the products we create today and I mean go Henry is a fabulous example of this but the products being useful to future generations and and financial literacy is such a big topic there that's obviously yeah, yeah. of huge importance to visa and and really matters to your business i think that's right i mean i think in terms of the importance of those products if we think about the central themes i think control security trust convenience and data is the way i kind of look at it at a thematic level but it is about teaching control in terms of lending spending and saving it is about enabling security in terms of, you know, is this is this something I want a young person to buy or not? Um, and facilitating that in partnership with control. Um, about trust as well, I think, you know, there's a life cycle here. And if young people can learn to trust brands that can then evolve with them, I think that's a fantastic story. And then the convenience in terms of the slickness and, and you know, the digital first, it, it's got to be there. It, it, you know, we've, we've got some, some real benchmarks now um, that fintechs have created. And I think it goes without saying as well, the data. Like I think because young people were excluded because incumbent banks perhaps didn't consider them as an eligible segment, there's no data on these individuals. So if we can create a, um, you know, a place where there's inclusion, then there is a, there's data on these individuals. And when they move into adulthood and they want to look at investment and lending opportunities, that can be done in a more responsible way because you have data on these individuals. Mm -hmm. So I think the products are so important and so foundational um, to create that financial literacy as, the people, as these kind of young individuals move through life. And I think it really, I mean, I just applaud 
go Henry. I think it is, you know, we've got so many advocates. Charlotte, Charlotte, our CEO, Charlotte Hogg spoke to Louise the other day and they're a family of advocates. But, you know, I think it's all underpinned by those central themes, which our products kind of enable. Um, and, you know, we have a duty, we have an obligation um, to help fintechs, you know, enable in this kind of new ecosystem and, and against new segments that they want to serve that may have previously been excluded. And, and would that just, just as a continuation to that, is that the kind of fintech you look for? So just thinking of listeners to the to the show today, you're looking for fintechs who really, you know, do do something as such, you know, meet a need and, and feel like exactly. that. Mm. Exactly. So fintechs, I mean, the way that we look at fintechs is kind of threefold. I might have mentioned this before, but kind of we support fintechs um, that want to, you know, access to, to, to VisaNet, but it's more than that, as as I said. And there's a there's a duty and a responsibility to um, to really enable those fintechs with knowledge, like it's imparting knowledge, as as Louisa said. You know, she didn't have all the knowledge of what it what it meant to issue a, a visa credential. Um, I think there's a partner element, and as we look at partners, we've recently kind of launched the the Visa FinTech Partner Connect. That mm. is a host of of FinTech partners that we haven't invested with, but we have a partnership with them where we believe there's mutual benefit or we can generate mutual benefit. I think the benefit that that basically Visa can provide is kind of the access to certainly our network, but also our banks, our merchants our globality, our global presence, um, our trusted brand, you know, the opportunity to scale globally. Um, and then what does the fintech bring? They bring new ideas, ways of thinking, you know, customer insight, just like the use case that Louise has explained. So that's kind of how we think about fintechs as, a, as partners. In terms of investment, I mean, it's again, it's about innovate and expand. Um, it's about solving kind of, you know, big, hairy, audacious challenges with you know innovative solutions for the sector as a whole um and we really look i mean from a from a visa perspective we look to invest where we see there are opportunities to expand our reach um into kind of a, a global commerce ecosystem around kind of pay and get paid um but but kind of that's what we look for from an investment point of view from a partnership point of view i think there's kind of this whole notion of mutual benefit mm -hmm. I think I think from my perspective, you know, the, we talk a lot about the four pillars of good money management at Go Henry. We talk about earning, saving, spending, and giving. And we want to make sure that as when children and teenagers use our product, they're learning about each of those things, but in a really practical way. You know, we we talk about learning by doing. And in order for us to be able to do that, we needed access to, to many of the, the visa services and network and, and, and products that they have available. Mm -hmm. And when we first launched, we were the new kid on the block. And it was a really new concept. It was that we were really first in market. And um, in that nanosecond of a customer's attention that you have, we had to put over not only what we were, but why we were a good idea as well. Mm. And I think the fact that we were partnered with Visa as the, as the new kid on the block, nobody had heard of us, having a major global name like Visa as a partner helped enormously with our credibility. Absolutely, uh, yeah. We, we, we talk when uh, people join Go Henry, we, we say to them, you need to think about the fact that we are asking customers to trust us with their children and to trust us with their money. And those are probably the two things that parents care the most about. <laughs> so that there is no doubt that seeing Visa's name on our website and on our cards gave parents confidence um, uh, yeah. in what we were offering. So they, they, you know, that made a huge difference. Absolutely. The credibility piece is huge and I can see the absolute value in, uh, and, and to your point there about sort of your children and your finances doesn't really get more important than that and put those <laughs> two together and it, um, you know, that's, it's, it's the gold, right? You, you know, you spoke about, you know, standing on the edge of the, the soccer pitch and, or the football <laughs> pitch, pardon me, um, and, you know, had this conversation and, and realised it was such sort of a need and then, and then you kind of go knocking on doors and you get this, you know, in with, with a company like Visa, uh, a huge business like Visa. 
how did that feel? And were there any sort of big, I guess, challenges that you sort of came up against? Was, was, it, was there ever sort of a fear of that, that perhaps your sort of little idea and baby would be kind of taken away or was it just, was it, has it always been a really sort of fulfilling relationship and they really understood your product and what you stood for and, and what you wanted to achieve? Oh no, the, the team at Visa absolutely understood what we wanted to achieve and and and, and were there to help us um, figure out how best to do that. No, very much so. No, it, it, to be honest, in, in the early days, I was more worried about high street banks thinking that it was a great idea and, and launching a similar product entirely free of charge. And mm. it took a little while for us to really to, I guess, accept that they're they're busy doing very different things. Mm -hmm. And um, although nowadays, you know, in the last couple of years, there have been a couple of the banks that have started to lower their um, age limits to allow younger children, younger teenagers to, to access their services. It's mm -hmm. still a very different service from, from what we offer. You know, we are in solely interested in providing services and a product that works for parents and kids and teenagers from the age of six to 18. And so that is our entire focus. It's not a, an adult bank account that's been um, tweaked to make it kind of suitable uh, for a child. And actually, yeah. I, I, I can give you a lovely example of that. I, my hmm. kids now, scarily, are 22 and 19. And um, <laughs> My 22-year-old, when, when she hit 18, obviously she'd kind of grown up on Go Henry and was used to the slick digital interface, to the real-time notifications. If a transaction failed, we tell them, we tell the kids why it failed. You know, you put your PIN code in wrong or you don't have enough money. Uh, mm. um, that information's available through the Visa network, mm. um, but most banks don't use it. Mm. Um and she left Go Henry. Um, she went to a high street bank. I shan't name them. One of one of the big ones. And yeah. um, because she was eighteen, got access to a digital the digital app. And um, I to this day, I wish I'd videoed her. Got in a complete rage because she checked her <laughs> bank balance on a Sunday to make sure that she got enough money for her Spotify subscription that she knew had to come out on Monday. So well done her for planning, planning and budgeting, and there was enough money. And then on Monday she got an email from Spotify to say that uh, her transaction, her, her subscription had failed, and they would suspend her service unless she <laughs> paid up within a few days. And um, because she's my daughter and has learned a lot about Go Henry and payments, um, she was furious because she said they know they what they didn't take into account was that she'd um, spent some money on Saturday. They hadn't showed her her available balance. They'd showed her the settled balance. Uh -huh. and yet she, so uh, she was like, but why don't they do that? They can do that. They have the information, but they don't surface it. That's outrageous. They made me go overdrawn. You know, that that really shows, I think, how this younger generation, they're growing up with, um, I'm going to say Go Henry as a slick, digital, real-time service. Yeah, they, They're going to have incredibly high expectations of financial services as they um, emerge into adulthood. And um, I think that's something that uh, a, a lot of companies need to take into account because then they're, they're not going to be prepared to accept some of the rather clunky things that uh, are in place that we adults use currently. It's really good advice. It's a, it's advice about this this expectation, and and you mm. just hit it spot on there as to what the next generation, if you like, will expect from their financial products. And I think that's something that all of the more traditional providers probably do have a steely focus on. And I guess their challenge is, you know, how quickly they can make change and digitize and implement. Um, you know, implement products and services, and you know, a slick interface. Um, I love that example. I think that's um, fantastic. I'm just checking the time because I knew I knew this conversation was going to go really quickly. One thing I did quickly want to ask you, Louise, was about the giving aspect of the of Go Henry. Can yeah. you just describe a little bit about that? Because I feel like that might be down this kind of um, you know <laughs> conscious kind of kind of theme, and I love that. I don't know about that. 
Well, we launched giving, um, gosh, it will be just over a year ago now. Um, and that really came about from looking at the data that we have and seeing that um, our kids, Go Henry kids, are were donating a lot of money to charity. You know, we could see just giving, we could see charity donations, all sorts of things. And um, we partnered with the NSPCC and we set up a feature on, on Go Henry that allows kids to donate as little as two pence a week if they want to, but for, mm -hmm. they can set up a regular donation to the NSPCC or just a one-off one. And um, it was fantastic, actually. Uh, it will be a couple of months ago now we were able to announce that um, Go Henry Kids have donated over £100,000 to the wow. NSPCC wow. In, in just over a year. Oh, and I think that, that again, you know, it really shows this generation, They there's a lot of people who say a lot of bad things about young people, but actually we know from the data that we have, and, and actually we produced a, a youth economy report um, not very long ago that we gave uh, fantastic insights into where and how children are using money and, and what they're spending it on. Mm -hmm. And what it's showing is that this new generation is much more conscious of the value of money and mm. they really do have some incredibly mature attitudes mm. you know they're, they're saving almost three times the um, average household savings rate in the uk um they're giving we talked about giving um since the start of lockdown uh, when well, we all know lots of charities are suffering from a real slowdown in funding mm. um the donations to the nspc have been up 22 percent with the younger age groups in particular, that was up 34%. And mm. they're learning how their money choices and their financial choices impact the world. Um, we launched uh, an eco card, as we call it, a few months ago, which is, I will chuckle when I say this, but it's made from field corn rather than <laughs> fuel. So um, very, very much less plastic in it. There's obviously an, an antenna and a, a couple of metal bits in the middle, but it's made from field corn. Oh. And we, we launched that in April and it shot straight to the top of our card options because, again, the kids can see that that is something that makes a difference. It's a, a conscious consumer decision that makes a difference. Yeah, I, and I, I get it. Sorry, I was just going to say again. That's just to the to the point of what the next generation is looking for. And Jill, I guess you would see this in in some of the products you're sort of bringing to market as well. And I know that's a huge focus for Visa. Absolutely, social impact's a massive impact. Uh, uh, really, a massive opportunity for us. We're looking at a lot of things we can do from a spend point of view, um, and mapping that to carbon footprints um, and making making people just more aware of what you know and what impact they're having um, from a sustainability point of view just from the payment data it's it's remarkable what you can do um, with insight from data as Louisa said whether it's spend insight or whether it's just getting getting a more a more kind of um, a better option in terms of not having as much plastic uh, circulating. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, after a bit of a tough year that we've kind of alluded to, it's really uh, comforting and, and sort of optimistic to hear both of these perspectives from yourselves. Look, I knew this would go really quickly. We've got a couple of minutes to go. Um, <laughs> I knew that would happen. But just very, very quickly, I just want to wrap up on um, just advice in, in business for both of you. And let's just put that women spin on it because we haven't really spoken about being women, but, you know, we are. <laughs> and we, are we are women in fintech. But just a little bit about it, some advice you've been given that you think has perhaps been really helpful to both of your careers and perhaps for any sort of fintech founders out there, women who might be, you know, wanting to, to partner with a great like Visa. Jill, do you want to go first? Sure. So I think from an advice perspective, um, and I say this a lot, obviously I, I talk a lot um, at, at, you know, in podcasts and, and events and, and, and panels, but I think courage, like courage is one of the big things I would mm -hmm. kind of focus on. Um, you probably know Erin Hansen, um, that Australian poet who said, uh, you know, there is freedom waiting for you on the breezes of the sky. And you ask, what if I fail? My darling, what if you fly? And I think women intrinsically don't take enough risk. We are risk averse. We lack courage. We're not brave enough. 
Um, so I think that is what I talk to a lot of my mentees about as I mentor them. So I think that's super important. And I think we have to, I think it's systemic in terms of what's happening in FinTech. There are no female founders, um, with the exception of probably Louise that's with us today um, and Anne Bowden from Starling. And, and, and I mean, that is across an, so many UK FinTechs and it's systemic because it comes from, you know, taking financial services and technology and combining them. And until we sort out some of these microaggressions, affinity biases, pay ge gender pay gaps, um, mm -hmm. and also some of the parental kind of policies that we have around maternity. And so there's equality there. We just won't tackle this because people won't feel like they belong um, and they won't be interested in this, in this space. So we're on a journey. Mm -hmm. We're committed to it at Visa. But I think that's kind of what I'd say is, is, yeah. is courage. I, I absolutely love the courage. I think I'm not sure if I've mentioned to you one of my favorite phrases is take the risk or lose the chance. Yeah. <laughs> and I've I've actually tried to live by that, I would say, probably for the last eight years. I've really that that one really sort of got to me. Um Louise, can you leave us with a few kind of words of wisdom? I mean, you certainly had courage in Spain. Well, you know, it, it's very interesting. And when Jill started to say that, I was uh, you can't see me here, but smiling to myself because I, my dad, growing up, my dad always used to say to me and, and my brother and sister, whenever we talked about doing something, he, his mantra was, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is you're going to fail. And if you yeah. fail, you pick yourself up and you start again. And, yeah. you know, growing up, I didn't really think terribly much about that. But looking back now, I realized just what strength that gave me. Mm. because you kind of always knew that, well, hey, you know, you dust yourself off, you start again. Mm. It does, it really gives strength. And and that is, I guess that that's the courage that it gives you. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a tough jump from a nice, well-paid corporate job. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a single mum with two kids, so nice big mortgage. But uh, it's, it's working out okay at the moment. <laughs> it, it, it absolutely sounds like it is. I feel like your dad might know my mum because she always said to me, Chloe, the worst thing they can say is no. So <laughs> she's like, but if you don't ask, you'll never know. Listen, thank you both. I, I knew we'd run out of time there. That was a wonderful conversation. So so much valuable information in there for, for anyone out there uh, founding a company, um, a, a woman or a man, quite frankly, um, and really interesting things going on in the payments and e-commerce space, certainly in financial literacy and this social conscience, which I love that we're seeing from the next um, generation. I would encourage everyone to check out Go Henry and also to check out Visa's uh, partnership programs that I know that uh, Jill is the driving force behind, and we'll pop that in the show notes, so please do uh, check them out. But thank you both so much for your time, and this was Women in Fintech. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you. Very special episode of Breaking Banks today and special for a lot of reasons. One is this is the first time I've actually been able to have Dan Rosen on the show. And so Dan and I go back to, he was our seed investor, lead investor for Perk Street back in 2008 when FinTech was not actually so much of a thing, certainly not as popular as it is today. Dan, I think I actually, between Dan and I, we scarred you for investing in to direct to consumer financial services. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think I definitely needed a little time off. <laughs> <laughs> Although you you put your toe back in the water with this space, but you know, when you think about, you know, what's happened over the last 12 years as it relates, you know, to fintech, you know, what do you think the big change is when we think about where where it was and where it's going? Yes, I mean, the first thing is, I'd say one of the lessons uh, I learned, and I'm sure you learned as well uh, from Perk Street, was the challenge of the building that business was just how long it took to make any changes to product and tech um, because the infrastructure was so bad. And, you know, the, the, um, you know, the plumbing wasn't there. I mean, it, it just, it was a different environment. So I think what that, in, you know, let's take the positive side of what you said, which is uh, that inspired me in the early days of, of commerce ventures to really focus on, you know, kind of fintech infrastructure and plumbing enablers, those types of things, both for traditional financial institutions who need a lot of help and spend a lot of money, 
um, but also for, you know, kind of next generation challengers um, who our companies serve as well. And, you know, I think over the years, we've made investments in companies where we thought the thing the company was doing was adding value specifically to a customer, like on day one, but where there might be an opportunity to create a platform or a broader network effect available to the company if they were successful and got to some real scale. Um, and those were those are probably a lot of the, the initial bets we made. Companies like, you know, we invested in Marketa, Bill.com, MX Technologies, um, and, and, and some others. So, you know, that's where we that's where we kind of started. Um, and I think from there, we've we've been fortunate to be able to invest in some more, you know, exciting companies that I'm happy to talk about and, and, and themes yeah. we well, and you know, let's think. Remember when we were first talking with Mon- with MX, it was Money Desktop, and they yeah. themselves were so consumer centric in what they were thinking, and less about like the plumbing problem that you brought up. In Wade, you've been a plumber now for you know how many years? Um, we, we, <laughs> so many directions that analogy could go, but yes, you've been a plumber, you know, in trying to fix the plumbing. When it comes to move and you know, this versus the episode with Maria, I really want to focus on why is infrastructure so hard? And why is it so broken? And you know, when you're at this and move has an incredible team, why is fixing infrastructure so hard? I think the reason infrastructure is hard to fix is there's this false primitive for web scale companies that there already is a solution in place. And all we need to do is connect that to the cloud, connect that to the internet. And, and it's true. I mean, the, that infrastructure is in place specifically in the branch banking world, a little bit in the prepaid or, or, or debit card world. Um, but when it comes to payment rails and deposit accounts and doing that in a you know, 2020 cloud native way, uh, it just doesn't exist. And so uh, really the first 10 years of, of my life was, wrapping the internet around something that was supposed to be located in the basement of a bank. And how do you expose that to the internet when it was never supposed to be exposed on the other side of the teller line? And so for, for us, it's, it's finally saying, hey, you know, this cloud thing's probably going to catch on. This internet thing seems to be gaining steam. Maybe we should build an, a new infrastructure from the ground up, you know, directly to the networks, nobody in the middle to blame uh, that actually works. So it, it's funny you bring up, it was never meant to access the internet. There's so many things, you know, when we think of what fintech and banking is facing today, that it was never meant to touch. And you're, yeah, those are the problems you're trying to tackle. Let, let's do a great one. Identity. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know how you do identity in a branch? Because you see Dan Rosen walk in the branch and you know Dan. And, and then the teller line access, think of that as like, admin access. They have access to everybody's account. Yeah. And the, but don't worry, it's safe because they're on the other side of the counter. They're just type in Dan Rosen. They look at all of his accounts. There's no primary account. There's no secondary account. There's just accounts. Um, and then they transact business in that way. So, so really what digital banking providers did, what we did at Bano and others, you know, Q2 and Malzai and M Foundry, et cetera, they built an automated teller in software to connect individuals to the accounts that they actually own. So even that basic principle of who are you, uh, let alone a username, pass- password, and multi-factor doesn't exist in some of the, the tried and true infrastructure. Um, so now, you know, if I, if I don't even have an identity of Dan Rosen, you know, how do I accept payments for Dan Rosen's customers? Uh, you know, mm-hmm. now, now we're two, three uh, levels of identity removed and risk removed. So Dan, when you've looked at the infrastructure problem, so scarred from Perk Street, you looked back at infrastructure, investing in things like Marketa, um, you know, it's a pretty tough problem. Like, where did you find that, you know, like maybe use Marketa as, you know, the poster child here. You look at it, it's like, this is such a hard and complex problem to solve. What makes you think a startup can actually kind of overturn that? Well, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, to some extent, what, like what Marketa did or, or Money Desktop now MX did, like they're kind of the same thing, which is they both started with like kind of the application, like the thing they wanted to enable. And then they realized that, you know, and there's a bunch of other examples of this we could go through people doing this. They realized that I think Plaid actually was this way. 
that actually all of the tech they built to enable that application was not available and everybody else needed it too. And it was, you know, kind of a bigger opportunity to provide that tech. Um, so in the case of Marketa, they built a full issuing platform, uh, you know, card issuing platform to support their own, you know, kind of card and, and commerce capabilities. And in the end, they realized that was the opportunity. And, um, and, and so I think it was more, you know, with the audacious, you know, founder mentality, I think it was less about like, we think we can do this because we're great. It was more about like, gosh, this was hard to do, but we did it. And we know everybody needs, we know people need this. And we think that this is the thing. So, um, you know, to, to an extent, it's really about that, recognizing that there are these big needs that just are not being served by legacy systems because the infrastructure is so dated. So, Wade, that, you know, beachhead that Move started with was really around how do we move money faster, right? Thus the name Move, not just, you know, the Iowa roots coming out in cow references. Um when you think of the beachhead and where you are now, how much bigger the problem is, what is the future of Move? Maybe talk first about what that beachhead is and how it's expanded now. Yeah, so when we started Move, the the common question was, I need to move money from A to B, right? And it, and it was never where I've, I've got a pile of money at A and I need to send it to 50 people over here or collect it from 5 million people over here, back to here. It was never a conversation of the rail. Um, it was always, how do I solve this problem of money movement inside of the United States? And, and money movement just isn't an ACH file, right? It's the OFAC, KYC, sanctions list, KYB, velocities, fraud, all, all the things that encompass with that FinCEN yeah. reporting and sponsor bank relationships. Um, and, and so if somebody knew a little nugget, it was, I don't just need to move money. I need ACH so I can move money. You know, right. They were trying to, to get to the root cause right away. And so, you know, at move, we really started off on, on being experts for Fedline, uh, ACH wire and image cash letter. And the, the pushback we got was, Hey, you're called move. I need to move money. You know, where's RTP? Where's wire? Where's uh, all these other payment modalities? And, and how can you help me do this? Because ultimately my problem in a platform company or a marketplace company is I need to pay in and pay out uh, and hopefully store money along the way. And I think that the simplest way of defining, not that FinTech needs another acronym, but we're probably not a banking as a service company. We're probably a pay in stored value payout company. Um, you know, let Brett King's brain explode with that one. Um, but, but that's really what we're up to. And so the market feedback was more, faster, quicker. Um, so just recently, we've, we've completed a Series A led by Angela Strange at Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Dan Rosen and the team at Commerce Ventures, and, and many of our seed round investors also participated in it. And really what that allows us to do is go faster, add more payment modalities and really service those customers with long-term roadmaps that they need in order to add payment functionality into their product sets. Yeah. And quick disclosure, at Alloy Labs is a, an investor as well. So you know, duly noted compliance people when you, you view this. So Dan, I think Wade brought up one of the, the points that when we look at solving these problems, one of the challenges banks and fintechs can really have is just the breadth of what the solution needs to encompass before it becomes viable. You know, just as Wade was saying, it's not just about ACH. You know, if we're going to really talk about moving money, I don't want you just to be my ACH company. I want you to like be this suite of things. That can be a hard, you know, move to invest against, you know, just the, the audacity of a founder that, yeah, you can scale your way to become a Marketa and everything they do now. But where do you find those points where it's like, it, you know that the beachhead is big enough that you can build a real company around it that earns you the right to go solve the other problems? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, there's, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that goes into making an investment decision in the space. The first of which is like, do you have an amazing team who understands the nuances of the space, you know, enter, you know, kind of a guy like Wade, who we know knows the space well after lots of battle scars and many years doing stuff in, in the space. Um, you know, so I think one is the confidence in the team that they know the problems, the problem space and, and can come up with solutions. Um, I think the other piece is like, make sure you're at least solving one problem to start. 
right? I mean, like, and I think it's if you if you start there, you earn the right to solve other problems for people. What's fascinating to me about Moon is actually the community you're making. That you started with the concept of community, which means people are engaged in solving each other's problems and helping you solve everybody's problems by testing the tech components and the you know and being sources of feedback on what's important, um, which to me is like this genius different model that like for everybody investing in you know Wade said banking as a service players who are like trying to be a next generation program management you know layer like it's just backwards like like stop guessing what the customers want let's actually have a community of people telling us what they want like that's what's fascinating to me about Moon. You know, from our perspective, that was one of the the big things the banks got behind is so different that they wanted to focus on was this level of engagement with the people you're actually solving the problem for. Because it did really flip, if you think about the traditional play, your you know, technology, your core provider tells you, you know, what technology they have, which defines what your tech strategy is. And your tech strategy then defines what products you can have. And the products you have define what your corporate strategy is. Nowhere into it enters the customer that says, here's the problem I have (laughs) that I want to go solve. So Wade, you know, with this new round of funding, what are the next set of problems that Move is setting out to solve? You know, the the consistent feedback we get is, When it comes to payments, I don't care the rail, but there's really three things I care about. Like what's the customer experience, which is typically tied to faster payments, right? How how do I move this money faster? Um, A little bit about cost, Um, you know, wires are expensive and, but, but mostly about risk and the flow of funds. So what we've really built out is a, a platform that allows people to do transfer codes that allows them to bring money in through one type, uh, send money out through a different type. The money yep. flowing out can go through um, all kinds of payment rails and the software developer doesn't have to worry about uh, how that all works. And so we just hope to you know, keep on adding additional payment rails. Uh, we're really excited about that. From a community aspect, we're over a thousand people in our Slack channel, which is probably, you know, my, to me, it's the most fun part about what we're doing is having a community of, you know, builders, developers, operators, investors that are all sharing knowledge with one another. Um, so that, that's super exciting to have that community continue to grow. You know, just today I had a $110 billion in asset bank uh, talk about wire a digital de novo talked to me about wire and a platform company talked to me about wire and to be able to listen to, and all three of them are in our community. So, you know, you can join the Slack channel, slack.move.io and figure out who those people are. But, you know, this was an open discourse inside of the community about wire and best ways of solving this problem. And I think that's a super refreshing thing for FinTech, which has typically been for financial services in general, where, you know, it was a black box in the sense that no one knew how it worked, no one collaborated on, on how to operate it. And, and if we can be the company that champions, you know, free and, and uh, collaborative sharing of information, you know, what an awesome privilege to, to help guide that. Well, uh, what an amazing way to end in terms of talking where the movement goes. And so thanks for sharing your announcement here today. Dan, thanks for joining as well on the special episode of Breaking Banks. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.